Um, has anybody ever read the book by Bob Buford called Half Time? Okay, so do yourself the favor, you know, outside of today, because as a business coach, the one of the things you will always get when I present to you is you get, get homework to do. So go make sure you get the book and read it, because its subtitle is called Some Success, From Success to Significance. And as I go through the discussion just now, I'll give you a bit of a journey of my career into where I am right now. But I was about six months, um, six months away from leading corporate and you know, resident to lot with what Caroline had spoken about earlier on. And my financial advisor gave me the book and got me to read it. And so I, I can attribute my change you know, out of corporate into what I'm doing at the moment to largely to that, and I blame him for that as, as well. But, but I think, let me just give you a bit of, a, a bit of a, an overview from my, from my side, because it, it puts a couple of things into perspective. So quite a bit of detail, I'm just going to talk it through. I spent 24 years in corporate uh, across a number of industries, mining industry, motor industry, uh, and the, latterly the, the fast-moving consumer goods industry, with again a UK-based organization called Cadbury Ships. So any of you have drunk or eaten the purple wrapper, please continue eating it. Um, I spent 17 years there, thank goodness, and I'm not in mining industry at the moment, given all its challenges at the moment. But in the last eight years in my career with Cadbury Ships, I was at the board level, both in the local business, uh, local business unit here, uh, and at the main board. And you know, when you get to that level, as Caroline tested to earlier on, there's a lot of frenetic activity that's going on. And um, I want to get on to a number of other parts of the discussion. But I remember in April 2006, my, my oldest daughter, uh, who's a, a real tough nut, um, was giving my wife a bit of a riff uh, one night when I arrived at home. And my working hours were saying like 3 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, you know, five days a week after the debate. And what do most fathers do when they walk in into the house and they find their daughter giving their, their wife uh, a, you know, a run for your money? Most of us will go in and go and play the rescue game. And my daughter, daughter turned on to me and said, Dad, what do you care? You're never at home. That was a Tuesday night. And it sort of really hit home to me. But unfortunately, two days later, a similar thing happened again. And I got to realize that then something's got to change it because she was quite right. You know, I was, I was, I was at best seeing my kids 10, 15 minutes a day. Stress levels up, we do a lot of acquisitions, disposals, reorganizations around the world. And I made the decision right there and then for a number of reasons that I was going to an actual fat concern getting out of corporate. Kind of long story short, negotiated my way out. I uh, spent another six months fixing up, uh, you know, finishing up one or two projects. And in one September 2006, did what most people would have read in Harvard Business Review, review uh, took a six month sabbatical. And it was a wonderful ex you know, experience because you used to get to gym at six o'clock in the morning. And you can imagine working for Cadbury Chefs for 16 years, etc. how much chocolate I consumed. <laughs> so we'd sit in a board meeting at eight o'clock in the morning and um, There'd be a bowl of chocolates in front of you, like this, and you know that old concept. You know, res, you know, resistance, resistance crumbles by eleven o'clock, and by six o'clock in the evening, you've gone through five of those bowls yourself. I can blame nobody but myself. So I got into this you know, sabbatical debate, etc. And I remember getting to gyms in the morning at ten o'clock, and we'd see a lot of these people in the gym at ten o'clock in the morning. Said, "Doesn't this bloke work? No. Does he have a job? No. Does he know what he's going to do? No. It's a wonderful feeling." But I, I, but I then came up after about six months, I knew I was going to get into consulting, stroke coaching, whatever the case may be, six months later, etc. The business that I'm running at the moment called Action Coach Business Coaching in South Africa, uh, you know, asked us to enter into the market and kind of also assured my colleague and I bought the master franchise rights for South Africa. And to date we've got a team of 45 business and executive coaches working in the South African market. Uh, Kharteng, Western Cape, Queensland, Natal, Namibia, and for my sins, I look up to Sub-Saharan Africa as well, including Nigeria. So, has anybody been and tried to do business in Nigeria for the last two to three years? Okay, but you know that's really got me going. You know, getting a real understanding of what it is we we're going to do. So, what I want to try and just give you a perspective is when you start looking at what you're doing from a business perspective, where's that balance? What do you do with your family and your kids, etc.? And some of the photos I'm putting here just try and reflect some of that as well. I've kept some of them off here for obvious purposes. When we look at the team, the culture that Caroline was talking about early on, with our team of uh, partners that work with us in the South African market, etc., a really great team of people that have worked with us uh, in the local market as well. And what we really do as business coaches, we're going to SME businesses and not necessarily incubator and startup businesses, 
but businesses in that sort of medium enterprise space and we're going to do complete analysis of what, what they're about because what we're about is to make sure that we take a business with a profitability of A to a profitability multiple times that at a far faster rate than they could have done it without a coach. Okay, and when you start seeing the testimonials come through that, then you start really unpacking, you know, what, you know, what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. So over, over the last 11 years, whilst I've been doing this, etc., a couple of things really come to my mind. And in discussions with a variety of people, um, th these thoughts con continue to come back to me. And you know, one of the questions we always say, why do business owners or why do people, entrepreneurs, start businesses? And you might think, well, that's a really basic question to ask. Okay. But the really important one for me, the second one is, what is the end goal for business? And I have to digress here. I was chatting to somebody in the banking industry the other day, and I hope I'm not going to be kicked out of the room for this. And I was happy chatting to a business banker one day and said, I'm not a businessman, I'm just a banker. Mm -hmm. Really? Are you advising somebody in banking? You know, in business? I'm not a businessman, I'm just a banker. But the, the issue here is that, you know, what is the end goal for business? And what I've found working with hundreds of business owners now is that very many of them have got no idea what their end goal is. I come out of a family full of medical doctors and they all look at me and say, you know, what's the end goal for them? What is the end goal for them? And so what I really came through to, to me, and we have probably different perspectives on this, is the end goal of the business, one of them is to, is to make sure that the business isn't just to get rich, but it's to, 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 to create a sustainable business for an entrepreneur that increases the NAV over a period of time and then very importantly, contributes to a bigger cause. So I was sitting and talking to my team of coaches a couple of months ago, in fact May last year, when we celebrated our 10th anniversary, we were really asking ourselves the question, what's the deal for us going forward? You know, how do we in fact make sure that we contribute to what's going on in the market? And at that stage of the game in South Africa, there's lots of discussion around radical economic transformation. And so as coaches, we started asking ourselves the question, what does that mean for us? Because we don't want to get involved in the political stuff. And the realization for us became the only real radical economic transformation can come when we take a business owner that is currently making a 24,000 rand profit a year to 7.5 million rand in, in uh, 12 months. We would take a business owner with a 29,000% growth in profitability in 13 months. 29,000%. Now, most of you will turn around to me and say to me, yeah, but Pete, that's quite easy when you take somebody with a million rand turnover and make an 8 million turnover. This is a 100 million turnover business. And his growth this year from last year is another 125%. That's radical. So we must get rid of the political slogans about radical economic transformation because the only way, only radical economic transformation in our book, in my book, is getting business owners to perform at that level. Does that make sense? Okay. So, but within that, you know, as we start talking that, I get a lot of entrepreneurs saying to me, but um, it's about balance, it's not all, all about money. Now I'm talking to the Institute of Bankers here, but most people, a lot of people say, well, Peter, I've started my business, I met somebody two days ago, he said, it's not about the money. So yeah, I get that. Until there is no money, then you see how quickly it, it is about the money. Okay? Because it's about the sustainability thereof. So when we start starting these, start these businesses, the other questions we get to ask ourselves this question is, what are we actually moving away from? What are we moving towards? And what is my why and what is my calling? Has anybody read the book, the book by Simon Sinek, or seen the videos by Simon Sinek? Next piece of homework, please. For anybody that's been in business or is in business, okay, if you haven't read Simon Sinek's book on why or the many cuts of, of videos on YouTube on it, that's your piece of homework for today. Because it starts talking around, I know Caroline spoke about that in her presentation as well, is really understanding why am I in business? Why am I, whether I'm employed or not, or whether I'm in my own business, it doesn't really matter. It starts understanding what's my calling, what's my bigger purpose. Because what I have found in working with business owners is that on a lot of occasions, they're quite happy to operate in their little huddle where they're based, be it, be it in Randburg, Centurion, Samson, or whatever the case may be, they're quite happy to operate 
within the constraints of their four walls. And my biggest realization got to me in the last year or two is that we as a country and as business owners and consultants, coaches, have got to get people to start thinking far bigger than that which they're thinking about at the moment. So I want to reverse back out of that quickly. When I go back into my corporate career, I remember going to you know, global conferences, etc. And um, I, I see you know, international speakers within the group getting up and presenting on some of the stuff, etc. And my colleagues and I look at the stuff and say, are they, really, are they, are they ranting about that? Because in South Africa, we had to deal with that type of stuff 15 years ago. Okay, but what I have found linked to that is that South African business owners, generally speaking, I'm generalizing, still suffer the issue that if it's not made in South Africa, it's far better than what we are. Yet my own experience, despite some of the challenges, my own experience is that there's a huge amount of really talented people that are leaders in this, in this business, in this country that can stand shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with people in a variety of markets around the world. But it's about what they're telling themselves about themselves and their own understanding of their own value proposition that really becomes an issue for me. So I get really passionate, upset, whatever you want to call it, about business owners that actually don't truly understand what their purpose is, truly don't understand what they've been called to do and to start doing things far bigger into a far bigger space than what they currently do because that's our God given responsibility. Okay. So when we look at that, one of the things that I talk to, to clients with about often, I'm just going to quickly move forward to that slide, is we talk about what we call the quality of life the debate. And it starts off entering first and foremost. The quality of your of your knowledge and your education is always going to be based on the quality of your of your mentor and your education. The quality of your beliefs and dreams is going to be impacted on your knowledge and education. And similarly to once you get your, your, your beliefs and your dreams resolved, that's always going to influence the types of questions and the deep depth of questions you're going to ask about what it is you're doing, what your business is about doing, and solving some of the problems going forward as well. I see that there's a repeat in ontologies. But then the quality of decisions then goes up to the impacts on the level of, of questions, we, of actions that we put into place. So how many of us have actually been in environments, in business environments, etc., when, when somebody's asked, when there's a problem, somebody's asked a question and they've got an answer. But the answer doesn't actually resolve the problem because the question hasn't been thought through carefully until somebody else comes in and asks a question from an entirely different direction. I remember sitting in a board meeting one day and we were having a huge debate about something for about an hour or two until our chairman got up after about an hour and he had, he had this ability to sit in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the board meeting and keep quiet and listen to all the debate for a while. And just at the last minute, just ask one question which would radically try to change the direction of the discussion. And 10 minutes later, we've actually resolved the problem. So the, the impact of you know, asking the right questions get the right actions, and the right actions then get to the to a different set of results. So part of what we do with business owners is to get them to really understand that. Now, similarly to what, what I've seen quite often is when we come back to why do people start business and what are they in and whether I should get into business for myself or not, is that these couple of questions I always make sure I ask business owners. Okay? When you're gonna get into business for yourself, you know, do I have the skills to be successful in the industry that I'm going into. So 15 years ago, somebody had asked me, we go, Pete, why didn't you take money and go and buy a spur franchise? You know, what's my chance of success on that? Because, you know, what did I know about, you know, running a restaurant? It's pretty zero, so my chances are pretty zero. Do I get into an industry that's growing or declining? How many times have I seen business owners start businesses, put big capital into it, into industries that are busy declining or plateauing? Now it's okay if you're going to do that when you understand you've got the solution to the next hockey curve. Okay? And then thirdly, the question is do I have the financial means to start this? Both in the initial upfront capital investment as well as working capital. And what I often find is that these top first three questions most business owners are happy to answer yes or the affirmative in the first two or any of the two and they expect the success ratio to come through. And so some of the discussion I have with people is you've got to be able to tick the box in all three to be able to give yourself some level of success. 
Then important to use what's my USP? What's my unique selling proposition in this? So I met with the business owner on, on Tuesday again, and she was telling me that she's starting in a business, uh, you know, into a particular area of consulting. And I said to her, well, that's fine. So are you and 15 other thousand people. How are you going to stand out in the crowd going for it? And then lastly, coming back to this question again around what's my exit strategy? Because what we do within the business, I'm just going to run through this pretty quickly, is to say, in our coaching process, is start working with business owners to get them to understand is how do we build this business so you can have an exit strategy? Even if your exit strategy is one of three things. Sell it, take the capital game, go and sit on the beach in Zanzibar. Grow it, franchise it, whatever, expand it in whatever format or shape you want to do. Or alternatively, get into what I call level five entrepreneurship, is where you and HFA have diversified ranges of businesses. And we always quote Richard Branson. Because from Virgin Records to airlines to banks to you know, you know, he's got that, he has built the team of people around him to allow himself to have a diversified range of interests. Okay, so you've got to have a clear understanding of what those exit strategies are going, going through for yourself. But I really want to come back to, to this particular point here for, for us today as well. And I think this comes back to the, 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 the title of the discussion from success to significance. I was meeting with a client of mine, in fact, he phoned me one morning and he said to me, Pete, you know, I'm not that sure that we want to, in actual fact, put in the amount of effort to build this business to the level that you want us to build it to. And so I ended up, ended up having a discussion with him and I went to meet with him on the, on the Friday and we had a full day, full day meeting with him. Because what I found, and I'm coming back to this, what I found with him was that he was very comfortable running his business, making some decent money, you know, driving a Mercedes Benz, house paid off, renovations in the house, kids out of the home, and whatever case may in his little huddle in Randwick. And so his business was in actual fact serving himself and at best his family. Very closely in that family. But he was an individual that had the gift of the gab and the skills to play a far bigger role than what he was currently playing at the moment. And so in some of the discussions we had with him, he said, and, you know, what happened in this case is they said, well, you know, I, I want to make sure that I lead, lead a balanced lifestyle. Okay, serious? Is that, is that what it's about? Is that, is that as good as it gets? And so through, through a series of discussions that day and subsequent days, one of the things I started doing with him and with subsequent business owners is to get every single person, now this could apply to whether you're sitting in a banking environment, corporate environment, and your own business environment is to start understanding that once you sort out yourself and your family, what, is, what role do I play next in my local community? Be that church, be that charity, be disadvantaged communities, or whatever the case may be. But what role do I play in that community? But it could also be the community of people that you're operating within, within the banking environment, or within the corporate environment you're operating. Because what I've also seen in corporates is too many times people coming in, sit down, pop down at the desk at 8 o'clock in the morning, do their job, hop us before you get caught in the rush going out. And you ask somebody, does anybody know about Pete? No. He comes in, does a bit of work, collects the paycheck. So what role do we play in our environments in actual fact to broader community that we are dealing with? Secondly, as a business owner or entrepreneur, what role do you start playing at a broader level within South Africa? And so what we started doing with our team and our clients is every single one of our clients is recognizing that you've been given the skills and the ability to build a business that has an impact at a national level. And so when I heard several Silver and talk about hashtag send me at his inaugural speech today, it was right up the alley of what we spoke about here. Because the politicians are never going to resolve the issues that are confronting our country. And the worst thing we ever do is to put that onus responsibility even on somebody like Silver Ramaphosa. It's up to the people in this room and to the entrepreneurs and business owners and corporate executives to get that right. And so what role do you and I play in South Africa? Because here's the other thing I found, and I'm blaming myself here as well. One of my pet hates in this country is, is litter. You drive through the smaller towns or even the bigger parts of Johannesburg, Pretoria, or whatever the case may be, and what do you see on the side of the road? Absolute litter. Disregard. And we blame the taxis, but I've seen as much litter being thrown out of Mercedes Benzes as I've seen thrown out of taxis. 
Now the question comes back to me because I was actually on my way to meet with John that morning when we were going to discuss that. And I was driving past a construction site on the N14. And there was just litter strewn on the site. And the question then reflected to me, said, what am I doing? What am I doing to nature fact effect it? If that's something that irks you, what are you and I doing? Because the government, the municipalities, don't have the capacity and the capability to deal with it. Or am I happy just to let that happen, you know, you know just for it to be, it is just the way it is. So if you take the little debate, and I'm just using one example here today, people say, yeah, but it's, it's an education problem. But hang on, when I drive through to Namibia or into Botswana, why is that not there? Have any of you ever driven from Namibia into South Africa? You can know within five kilometers that you're back in South Africa. Because there's little on the side of the road, but not in the middle. So don't come to me with that debate. So therefore, the debate is, what do I do, what role do I play at a broader local community and a South African level to start, for argument's sake, in this case, a little free in mind? Because Pretoria and Joburg, particularly Pretoria where I live, and I live in a, in a really, really, really decent part of the country, or of, of the city, has become a dumping zone. And so we've got to ask ourselves, what do we do? Using our resources and our sustainable businesses that generate profits to make space start impacting on with bigger causes. But then lastly, it comes back to this debate. Whether you're in corporate, whether you're in entrepreneurship for yourself, what's stopping you and I from building our businesses to have a global impact? Because the majority of us are happy to run a business in, I'm going to use Randburg again as an example, and as long as it's paying the bond education. You know, kids' fees and, 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 and you know, and use nice new car every now and then, I'm happy. But we need more and more business owners and entrepreneurs to actually fact start playing in a far bigger role. Now, one of our clients based in Namibia, my well, coach phoned me one day and said to me, Pete, um, you know, I'm struggling to get um, young to, to think far bigger about where he's going to his business. So, well, first and foremost, and I think this will be Caroline touched on it, where is your level of thinking? as far as it's concerned. Now, yeah, a really, really big business owner in the middle. He's a big player, but it's a population of two million people, and probably more than two million people in, in, uh, in a low earn set, okay? But so the debate with him was, you know, Jan, how do we take your business and start replicating that and moving that back into sub-Saharan Africa and for that matter, given the level of success and experience you had, what stops you from, you know, impacting at a global level? So let's start Sub-Saharan Africa first and let's start looking global. It doesn't have to be Sub-Saharan Africa. But there are many, many examples of business owners and some really sharp entrepreneurs in this country that have the ability to start thinking in a global level. But it's your and my responsibility to actually get everybody to start thinking that. Now that could also be come back to corporate. To what extent in your corporate role are you building, your, you're building up a, a a reputation, a movement, a, 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 a sense of purpose that has an impact within your, in your business at global level. Or you and I are just happy to come in to collect the paycheck and walk out of here. So it's something that I've become really keen to talk to business owners about. And particularly, as I said, when Cyril Cameron said, um, the send me, send me hashtag. But there are too many examples of people that are sitting and playing small. We have not been given the skills or the opportunity, financial and otherwise, for us to sit here and just operate a little shop in, in Randwick. There's got to be something far bigger than that. And every single one of us has got to think around how do, we, how do we build that, both within our businesses as well as society. Very briefly, but, you know, um, to wrap up so I can leave some questions, but one of the things that I do with business owners is to go through what I call the DG LPA. How do you dream? What's the dream? What's the, what's the purpose for the business? Okay, what's the goal? But then very importantly, what do you need to learn? So if you, for instance, very simply put, if one of your goals is to start a property company and to use the proceeds of your business to, to build a property investment vehicle, in my case, what do I know about property investments? Next to nothing. So to what extent do you know, in fact, to one start reading, one start getting a coach or a mentor, or somebody that I can work side by side with to help me in that particular portfolio.
Because then I can start saying, right now, what plans are I putting to put it into action? Not for the year, for the next 90 days. So what we do within our coaching environment is work with business owners and focus very heavily on what has to happen for the next 90 days. Annual plans just don't work for them. It's got to be what they've got to do in the next week, next 90 days, so that we can build that into place. And then you build the acting process into place. Okay. So when you look at that, etc., for me, the concept of going from success to significance is to continuously go down this journey and ask yourself the question, what role am I playing in my business, both from a leadership capacity, and that's when Caroline asked the question, how many of you rate yourselves in inspiring leaders? Unfortunately, I have seen the statistics. I was careful not to answer it, but I could answer it diff differently as well. But I know that there's so much area to grow in Switzerland. Okay? And I know that if I had asked my team today, given my interaction with them at 8 o'clock this morning, whether they thought I was inspiring, they'd definitely say that. Okay? But what role do we play to actually take our business and use our business as a vehicle for change? So in, in, in the action coaching environment, we've turned around in May last year and said, how do we go about continuously creating thriving businesses in South Africa that transform communities and impact the economy? Now, a team of 45 highly experienced business coaches say, Peter, how do I impact? How do I impact on the economy? So we've got about 700 business clients at the moment across the country with a plan to grow that to about 2,500 by the end of 2020. And so if you get every single one of those business owners getting a 40, 50%, 50% growth in profitability, you can start in understanding the impact we can have on the economy. And guess what? I've got some brochures in the back there for those of you who want to grab them, etc. There's a case study booklet in there. My coaches don't believe that putting a, a case study of a client who's got a 50% growth in profitability is worthy of putting into a case study booklet. How many business owners would want a 50% growth in profitability plan? And so, for us, it wasn't just about starting the business in South Africa. It's for us to start getting to a point where we could take large numbers of business owners to get that level of growth because we can start impacting our employment. One of the things we're starting to measure in our business at the moment is how many jobs through the work we've done with our clients are we actually creating in the market? Because it is the number one ill in this country. You start asking yourself the question, what actions are you and I taking today with our clients today, that's going to impact on that going forward as well. All right. So I'm just going to just whip through to the to questions, leave that last slide there. So a big thing for me, really, just to summarize, is really important for us to actually understand that the vehicles, the businesses we've got, the businesses that you support, is to what extent are you in active fact helping them grow? To what extent are they being challenged to think about what skills they have, what resources they have, to operate at a fundamentally different level. Because we have to start thinking outside of the four rules that we're operating at the moment. Okay. Any questions? I think we've got five minutes left. Questions? None. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks. Tina? Can I come yes, on? Yeah. Um, you as a coach, when you get involved, when the business is at its pinnacle and doesn't know how to go further, or when it's sunset? Both. <clears throat> we have a number of clients that are what I call elastoplast clients, okay, <laughs> that, are, that are just are struggling to make it, uh, and they're a challenge to work with in any case. But a number of our clients are people that have been very successful to that, but just didn't have the ability to take it to the next level. And so those are the great clients to work with because talking about their purpose and their why and their dream and, and what they want to do and the resource they want to do to build their business, that's a great client to bring on board. But there are a number of occasion clients that, as I said, are elastic plus clients that, you know, you've got to help them out of the whole of the uh, Now the million dollar question. <coughs> if you can give a percentage which you will not held to, what do you say? 10% down at the bottom and 90 upstairs? Probably about, probably about 40% of the bottom and 60% at the top end. So it's pretty close. So. Thank you. Sometimes, sometimes it, it could be it could be higher than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it could be higher than uh, higher at the bottom end. Uh, there are lots of people that are struggling at the moment, so the demand for that is huge at the moment. And which of the two sections give you the most satisfaction if you have success? I I uh, I prefer working with the clients that are sitting, you know, in, in the doldrums. No, no, 
sitting, working into needing to go to, to build and double their business from where they are at the moment. Uh -huh. um, it's a far quicker turnaround. It's you know, and it's a longer, long, longer client. Um, they're very committed to what they're needing to do. Uh, quite often, the people at the bottom end actually want you to come in and do the work for them, and so you're going to get over that particular hurdle with them as well. Right. But having said that, I enjoy doing quite a bit of work in corporate, is because uh, I love sitting now on the outside and not being part of the politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I can go and spend six hours in the corporate environment for the day, etc., and then get out and realise that's why I left corporate in the first place. Okay, <laughs> and make that change. All right. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a common acceptance nowadays that in business planning is short term. It's never more than 18 months. And there's reasons for that technology, etc., etc. And they disruptive things and so on. What, what do you find um, in your work? Um, is there a lot of short term quick fixes or is it more yeah, <coughs> planning in a I'm not a, not a fan of three and five year plans. Uh, at best, one year one year one year goal. But then, as I said earlier, on what we do is we work with business owners and just understand what they're going to do for the next 13 weeks. Because I don't know about you, even when I was in corporate, guess what happens? You know, month eight, nine of the, of the year, you look at your your list of achievements or the kind of oh, crumbs we haven't we haven't focused on that. So let's, there's a quick rush to fix up things towards the back end of the year because there's a performance management system that's coming in your workplace because. So for us, it's very clearly now a focus around what's going to happen next week, next next couple of next 13 week period, and those are chunks that we can build up towards what we want to do with the dissipator. And things are changing just all the time. Mm -hmm. Things are changing all the time. I think it's just very difficult to to, to project, you know, three to five years out. That one one asking is it can take a year before mm -hmm. large corporate even accepts that there's a bit of a problem, something they've got to work on. And in the meanwhile, you're in the limbo, you know, being anxious, trying yeah, to get I, things I, going. I think it's a generalisation. I think a lot of corporates are pretty good at planning. Those that still do the planning uh, properly, and they can they can turn around in a far shorter time. But I do know that there are businesses that will take years to, to do the change, etc. And I, even when I was in corporate, said I remember an environment where one of our where one of our directors had left us and went to a competitor business, and they launched the product into their market that we were planning and researching. And the one thing about working uh, within within the Cadbury Shapes Group, is they they researched to the nth degree, okay. But the problem is that this was a far more the, the competitive business was a far more entrepreneurial type of business. They took the idea, ran with it, and failed quickly, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the bottom line is they got to they got the march on six months into the market because we just wanted to make sure that we crossed the T's and dotted the I's and the our I's were right and, and everything else. Like in the meantime, somebody had taken the concept, put a product together, pumped it up to the market. Oh. Yes. No. Simple enough. We've had a long debate about that a couple of times, but uh, we believe it, it messes up our objectivity. So we don't we don't buy it. We don't we don't we don't even train it. It gives me the opportunity just to be objective. Because my job as a coach is not to be your mate. And if I believe you're making a wrong decision, I'm gonna tell you. Okay. Alright. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.